Imagine opening your IELTS results and seeing IELTS speaking, band nine. How would you feel? Well, in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at some tips to make that dream a reality. We're going to be looking at nine tips to help you get band nine in IELTS speaking, coming up. Welcome, my name is Eli and I run the website EnglishProTips.com where we help students get ready for the IELTS test. Now in today's lesson we're focusing on IELTS speaking. In particular we're going to be looking at nine tips for band nine in IELTS speaking. Now you'll know that the speaking test has three parts. Part one is four to five minutes long and you'll be asked some questions about yourself and your experiences. Part two is when you have to speak about a topic for two minutes. You have one minute to plan and prepare. And then part three is a discussion related to part two. So for example, on the same theme or roughly the same theme. Now we're going to be looking at three tips for part one, three tips for part two, and three tips for part three. So nine tips in total. Let's first focus on part one. So in part one, you're going to be asked some general questions about you. Now you never really know what you're going to be asked. However, you can prepare for the common topics. So the common topics are where you live, where you were born, your work, or if you don't work, your studies. Now I recommend that you practice answers for these four topics because they are the most likely to appear in part one and right at the beginning of part one. So by feeling confident with these topics you're going to be off to a good start and be able to be more confident throughout the rest of the test. So let's look at some typical questions. How would you describe, so how would you describe where you live? where you were born, your work, your studies. How would you describe where you live? Well, I live in Dublin in a modern apartment on the outskirts of the city. Okay, so I'm going to learn some vocabulary to help me answer this question, like modern apartment, outskirts of the city. These are useful collocations for talking about where I live. How would you describe where you were born? Well, I was born in London in a semi-detached home, a semi-detached house in a residential area of Brixton. So semi-detached, so a semi-detached house, a good collocation, residential area, meaning an area where lots of residents live, lots of people live. How would you describe your work? Well, I run my own business, English Pro Tips, and I create educational content. So run my own business create educational content. Useful collocations for talking about my work. What about my studies? How would I describe my studies? Well, I wasn't really sure what to study, but I ended up choosing economics. So I studied economics at university. Now, wasn't sure what to study. That's a useful language chunk. Ended up choosing economics. So end up choosing. That's a phrasal verb. Okay, so learn some useful vocabulary for how you would describe where you live, where you were born, your work, or if you don't work, your studies. Next, what do you like about where you live, where you were born, your work, your studies? Well, <clears throat> what I like about where I live in Dublin is that it's very tranquil. It's very laid back. So that means it's a very calm and a relaxing place to be. I was born in London and I really like that London is a dynamic city. So it's lo there's lots of go stuff going on. For example, uh, lots of music events, lots of theatre, lots of art, lots of culture in general. I also like that there's lots of diversity. So people from all over the world. And when you walk down streets in London, you hear all sorts of languages and you see people from all around the world. And I love that diversity. I work. Well, I have a lot of autonomy, so a lot of independence. I can choose what to do and when to do it. And it's also very rewarding. So, for example, when you guys get high scores in IELTS and you let me know, I feel very um, fulfilled. It's very rewarding. My studies, well, studying economics really opened my mind, it broadened my horizons. I also had lots of interesting classmates that I could have discussions with. Okay, so answer these questions for yourself, for where you live, where you were born, your work, your studies. And also answer this question. What don't you like about where you live, where you were born, your work, your studies? 
So where I live now in Dublin, in, in the particular area of Dublin I am in, it's a bit dull and a bit bleak in winter. So dull means boring and bleak is a bit mm, gloomy and dark and not very much going on. In comparison, London, where I was born, is very overwhelming. There's almost too much going on. It's also very expensive. The rent in London is astronomical, which means very, very expensive. My work, well, sometimes it's a bit lonely and also never ending in the sense that I've got so many things I need to do. Plan lessons, mark essays, create more content. My studies, well, I used to hate having lectures first thing in the morning and I had lectures very early on a Monday morning, which was difficult for me. And some of the lectures were rather boring. In fact, particularly those ones that were first thing at, on a Monday morning. Okay, another very common and difficult question to answer is this. What would you like to change? So what would you like to change about where you live, where you were born, your work, your studies? Okay, so in terms of where I live, Dundrum in Dublin, I wish that there were better transport links to the centre so it was easier to travel around. Every time I want to travel, I usually have to get into my car. I wish I could just get on the bus and be straight to the city centre. I wish that London had cheaper rent. I wish that my work, or rather in my work, I had more collaborations with other teachers. I really enjoy that. And in my studies, economics, I wish that there was less focus on maths. I like doing all the reading. But I didn't like the focus of on mathematics in my studies. Okay, so also answer this question, what would you like to change? It's a tricky one to answer on the spot, so have a think about what you would say before you go to do your IELTS test. Okay, tip number two, listen carefully to the question. And from my experience, there are two things that really um, confuse students. The first one is the use of would. So things like, would you ever like to live in a snowy country? So a snowy being a country with lots of snow. Um, now, when I ask this question, people often say, no, I don't. I don't live in a snowy country. But I'm asking, would you ever like to live in a snowy country? So you could say things like, uh, yes, I would. In the future, I think it'd be a lot of fun. However, I wouldn't want to stay there for too long, maybe just one year or two years. Or what would make your work better? So don't talk about what you like about your work or what you don't like about your work. Talk about what would make your work better. What would your perfect Sunday be like? Okay, don't talk about what you do on Sunday. Talk about what your perfect Sunday would be. So hypothetical perfect Sunday. So be careful of would and also be careful of some people. Why do you think some people spend a lot of money on their car? Not why do or not do you spend a lot of money on your car? It's why do some people spend a lot of money on their car? So you have to imagine yourself in their position and say, well, they might spend a lot of money on their car because they need it for their work to show a certain um, or to make a certain impression on their colleagues or on their clients. Why do some people find it difficult to exercise regularly? So maybe you find it easy or difficult to exercise regularly. But what I'm interested in is why do some people, so other people, find it difficult to exercise regularly? So you do get these questions quite regularly in part one of the speaking test. Be careful of would and be careful of some people. Okay, <clears throat> if you don't know what the, or you don't know how to answer a question or what it means, you can always say something like, sorry, could you repeat that please? Or sorry, what does mean? So what does snowy mean? And then the examiner will explain it. Okay, tip number three. Don't give short or long answers. Instead, give natural answers. Okay, let me explain. I often get this question. How long should my answers be? One sentence, two sentences, three sentences? And I've always found it quite difficult to answer this question because sometimes one sentence is enough and sometimes you want to have five sentences. Now I found this great video by Shelley uh, who is another IELTS teacher and she has a, a, a YouTube channel called My IELTS Classroom and she made a 16 minute video just on this question alone and I loved what she said. She said, take as many sentences as you need 
to answer the questions naturally. Okay, so answering the questions naturally. Sometimes you're going to speak for five seconds, it's going to be a short answer, and sometimes you're going to speak for 40 seconds or 50 seconds and have multiple sentences. Do so naturally. And I also saw this great quote from Keith, so the Keith Speaking Academy. He said, I would say, if you are not sure about your answer on the topic, give a short answer. Much better than pausing and hesitating because you are unsure and so showing your lack of fluency. And this is the part that I like the most. Elaborate when you are confident on the topic or have lots of ideas or just seem to be on a roll or in the flow. You know, when words just seem to flow easily. So when certain questions really um, interest you and you find yourself just having a lot to say, go with it. Don't stop yourself short. But at the same time, if there's a question and you don't really have much to say, don't try and extend your answers. Do it naturally. Okay, let's move on to part two. And part two is the dreaded part of the speaking test where you have to speak alone in front of the examiner for two minutes. Okay, my top tip for this is to tell a story. So when you get your topic and you're speaking for two minutes, tell a story. Now remember, all stories have a beginning, a middle and an end. Okay, so what are we going to do in the beginning, middle and end? At the beginning, we're going to set the scene. In the middle, we're going to describe what happened. And at the end, we're going to reflect on what happened. Simple. Let's look in more detail. So, setting the scene. Imagine we get a part two topic like this. We have to talk about a special holiday we've had. Describe a special holiday you have had. You should say where you went, how you travelled there, who you went with, and explain why this holiday was so special to you. Now, when we're setting the scene, we're going to provide some context. We're talking about who we went with. Did we go alone? Did we go with a friend? Um, who bought the tickets, for example? Who were we visiting? So, who? We're also going to answer where. Where did we go? Where did we buy the tickets? Where did we visit in that country or in that city? When did we go? When did we buy the tickets? Uh, when did we decide we wanted to go to this place? Why? Why did we want to go to this holiday destination? Why not somewhere else? And finally, how? How did we travel there? Um, how did we spend our money? How did we spend our time? So by answering who, where, when, why, how, there's a lot that we can say when providing the context and setting the scene. Another good idea is to explain your thoughts and feelings. So before you went on holiday, how were you feeling? Were you nervous about going on holiday? Or were you excited? Or were you um, very keen to go and see an old friend of yours who lives in Italy or France? Explaining your thoughts and feelings before you start describing what happened is a great way of providing context for your story. You can always say things like, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about a special holiday that I've had, or at the time I was living in China, but I had to travel regularly to go and visit my girlfriend. I used to go on a lot of rock climbing trips, but this time we decided to have a beach holiday. On this particular occasion, we decided to go to Italy because we both love ice cream and the beaches there are beautiful. So you can use these phrases to um, set the scene in your story. So beginning, set the scene, middle, what was it that we're going to do in the middle? We're going to describe what happened. Now, we usually describe events in chronological order, which means in the order that they happened. So we'll use linking words and phrases, things like first, after that soon after, just after, at that moment afterwards, then, finally. These phrases help us to organise the events as they happen. So this is going to help us to get a higher score for fluency and coherence in our IELTS speaking test. Okay, so beginning, set the scene, middle, describe what happened. What do we do at the end? Can you remember? At the end, we're going to reflect on what happened. So we can say things like, if I could change one thing about this holiday, it would be that I would eat more ice cream or maybe uh, wear more sun cream because I got so burnt at the beach, for example. If I ever go back, I'll make sure to visit the Leaning Tower of Pisa, so a famous historical building. I guess the main reason why this holiday was so special was it was the most relaxing holiday I've ever had. One thing I learned from this holiday was always wear factor 50 sun cream. 
Okay, so you can use these phrases and you reflect on the story that you've just told the examiner. This is really going to help us to give full answers. However, what do we do if we run out of things to say? So we're trying to speak for two minutes, we're at one minute 40 seconds and our mind goes blank. There's nothing else to talk about. We've finished our story and we've reflected on it. Here's what you do. Tip number five, you talk about the future. If, uh, if I ever go back to Italy, I'll make sure to da -da -da -da, eat more pistachio ice cream. Next time I go on holiday, I'll certainly um, book the hotel in advance. I thought about going back this summer, but in the end, I decided to go to so-and-so a country, France. Or I decided to um, not go on holiday and save my money. In the future, I'll in the future I'll stay in an Airbnb instead of a hotel. Okay, so if you're running out of things to say, just change the time period you're talking about and start to talk about the future instead. You'll find that there's so much more that you can say about your topic. Okay, how num uh, tip number six is to practice by recording yourself. So get your mobile phone or your computer, ideally your mobile phone, and then look at a topic, for example, a special holiday, and record yourself speaking for two minutes. Now, how are we gonna do this? We're going to do it multiple times. So do the same topic multiple times. Don't just do one topic and then move on to the next. The first time we're going to focus on speaking for two minutes and we're gonna practice telling our stories and reflecting on what happened and talking about the future. Then we're going to listen to our story and we're going to correct the mistakes. So we're going to say, oh, I forgot the article there or mm, that was the wrong tense. We're also going to look up any new vocabulary that we need. Maybe words that you knew how to say in your first language, but you didn't have in English that would help you to communicate your story better. So look up those words and then we're going to record ourselves again, focusing on accuracy. So correcting those mistakes with articles or tenses and including those new words. And then afterwards, we're going to do it again and we're going to focus on the fluency. So making sure that it's as fluent as possible. So we pause at the right moment. We use the right discourse markers. And by the end, so we've recorded it three times, we're going to have a very solid part two. And that's when we're going to move on to the next topic and to do a new topic for part two. Some people even benefit from writing down their answers. Okay, part three. So you know that in part three, you have to have a discussion about the same theme as part two. So for example, if we were talking about um, a special holiday in part two, we might talk about holidays or tourism or ecotourism, that kind of thing. The first tip, so this is tip number seven, use discourse markers. Okay, I was recently doing a speaking test with um, a lady who got band eight in the speaking test. Um, for the British Council in Kenya and what I loved about the way she spoke is that she used a lot of discourse markers So in part three she would say things like this There are two reasons why I think that there are two reasons why I think that people love to give gifts to others First of all da 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 Secondly da 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 So she breaks down her ideas very well and she makes it very cohesive and organized Now you'll notice I've underlined the word two there are two reasons. I highly suggest saying there are two reasons and not saying there are three reasons. It's much easier to think of two reasons than to think of three reasons. What you might find is you say, first of all, da da da, secondly, da da da, third of all, that's all I can think of. So just go for two reasons, it's much easier for you. I think it depends on, so this is a great phrase. A lot of the time you get asked questions like, um, what kind of gifts do people give in your country? And you can say, well, it depends on how much money they have or how old um, the gift giver is and the recipient is. So it depends on. Now elaborate on why it depends on it. So it depends on how much money they have. If people have a lot of money, then they can afford more expensive gifts. However, if people don't have as much money, they might rely more on making homemade or handmade gifts. Well, in my country, from my experience, so this is a good way of um, making the, easy, the question a little bit easier for yourself. You can say, well, from my experience, people who don't have so much money tend to give homemade or handmade gifts. 
okay? It's not clear cut. So again, you in IELTS, you tend to get a lot of questions like, are boys better at science than girls? You can say, hey, it's not clear cut, which means it's not obvious. And then you elaborate on what you mean by that. So when is it, um, why isn't it clear cut? You can say, well, actually it depends on a whole host of other factors. Okay, tip number eight, use the REE -E method. So what is REE? -E? Well, this is a framework that I've come up with that I think will help you to give full answers in part one and part three, especially of the speaking test. It stands for respond, elaborate, example. So REE. -E. Let me give you an example. Imagine you get a question like this. Do parents or teachers have more influence on young people? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is the first R, um, respond. So something like this. I would say that parents have more influence on young people. Okay, and now we need to elaborate. We need to explain why we believe that. So let's say something like this. To begin with, in most families, parents will spend more cumulative time with their children than teachers. Okay, so we've elaborated on why. Let's show the examiner a higher level of analysis by even giving an example. For example, children will only really spend time with their ch teachers while they're at school. However, they'll, spend, they'll often be with their parents before school, after school, at the weekend and on holiday. As a result, as a result, parents spend more time with their children. Okay, and then we can also use the same method and repeat it to give the opposing view. Saying that, I can also see why some people think that teachers have a lot of influence on young people. Our teachers often shape our idea of the world. For example, a politics teacher and the books they give us to read will often influence the way that we view the political system in our country. Likewise with history. And then we give an example about history. Okay, so we can use the REE -E method to give full answers in part three, but also part one of the speaking test. Okay, the final tip, tip number nine, don't focus on yourself. So take this question, what happens if I said this? My parents had a very large influence on me because, no. In this case, we're talking about our own experiences, which is what we do in part one, but not part three. Instead, we're gonna say parents have a very large influence on young people because, so in this example, we're talking about parents in general, young people in general. So what happens if we do talk about ourselves too much? Well, typically two things happen. One, the examiner might interrupt you. They say, okay, but what about people in general? And that can sometimes feel a little bit awkward to be interrupted in the middle of speaking. But the second one is worse. What they might do is they, they might think to themselves, well, this person can't talk about unfamiliar topics. And if they think you can't talk about unfamiliar topics, it's going to be hard to get band seven or above. So try not to focus on yourself too much. If you do get a question like this and you're not really sure of the answer, you can always say things like, hmm, I've never really considered that, I guess. And then you try to give your answer. Or, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask, but I'd say, and then you give your answer. Or, hmm, tricky question, I reckon, and then you give your answer. Interesting question, I think, and then give your answer. The important thing is that you try to give an answer and that you don't just stop or begin to talk about yourself. Okay, best of luck with your studies. And um, let me know if you find these tips useful. Let me know how you get on in your speaking test. I'm always excited to hear from you. You can send me an email at eli at englishprotips.com. Um, good luck with your up and coming speaking test and all your other tests, the writing test, the listening test, the reading tests. You've got a lot on your plate. Okay, best of luck with all of your studies and I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye. <laughs>